welcome from the Manhattan Beach Community Church, an interfaith and interdenominational church at the crossroads of life. We bring you portions of the Sunday morning service from our beautiful sanctuary at 303 South Peck Avenue in the community of Manhattan Beach. We are glad you are joining us for this special service, and we hope it will be a source of inspiration and direction for you in the days ahead. We also invite you to join us in person this coming Sunday morning or any Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. For more information about the church and its wide-ranging programs, please feel free to contact the church office at 310-372-3587. And now, our Sunday morning service. Another Sunday morning and we are gathered here again. It appears to be an ordinary gathering of women, children, and men, but a closer examination reveals something quite unique, a dynamic interfaith community that assembles week after week. For more than a hundred years now, this congregation has stayed together, a faithful remnant of God's holy people, bound by the Spirit's tether. Each of us an individual for a differing point of view, some emphasizing the tried and true, others that which is new. A deep dedication to serving God and the needs of our community is the primary ingredient that would explain our continuity. Grateful for the heritage given to us by those who have gone before, for a meaningful present, and a confident future, our God, we now implore. Let us pray. Loving God, we are grateful that we can assemble here this day with people we have known and loved and those we have yet to meet. That you surround us with like-minded people who are in pursuit of the higher goals in life, who seek to put into practice the values they hold most dear, we're thankful for the church and what it means to us, opportunities to serve and to give thanks, to praise and to worship. There are many among us who are in special need this day. We are aware of some of these and ask for your tender care to be upon them, ministering to the ways in which they can both adequately respond and be aware, that your presence might be with them in their declining years or their time of loneliness and grief, their time of consternation or indecision. May we be aware of each other as we go through life, and while we might not always be as open as we would like, may we be somewhat aware of the needs and necessities that we have as individuals. Bind us together then this day, we pray, in our oneness in Jesus Christ, for it is in his name that we make our prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Good morning. Okay. How are we doing now? Ah, sorry. Any little light. Let there be light. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, I am the new associate minister of youth and families. I hope I can keep the new title for a little while longer and you can forgive uh, some of the foibles. Um, but I'm having so much fun this summer um, with the youth. Last night we did a girls movie night, a chick flick. Uh, we watched Pretty in Pink, classic 80s movie. Kind of resonates, I think, still. Ducky, still enjoy Ducky, the character of Ducky. Um, and then we watched Ever After, which is really the story of Cinderella. And I thought it was interesting that both those stories were somewhat similar in their view of love and redemption and care for one another. Um, but I wanted to um, let you know that I have been gone for a couple weeks. So if you didn't know that, it's OK. Um, I won't be offended, uh, but I was gone for two weeks taking a polity class, which is just a fancy way of saying um, church history. Uh, I'm going to be ordained in the United Church of Christ, which this church is affiliated with, and so I had to take a course on the unique aspect of the United Church of Christ, and um, I also went to what was called our General Synod. Uh, every two years, our body um, of church, churches get together, send representatives to what's called the General Synod. This was in Grand Rapids, uh, Michigan. Anyone been to Michigan? There's some people that actually emailed me and gave me tips, and I was really excited about that. Although it did take me a couple days to realize that, oh, there's Rapids and they're Grand. Oh my gosh, I get it, Grand Rapids. Uh, and I also noticed something like, Groves of trees, greenery, trees as I walked around. Uh, but we were on Aquinas College, and uh, we took this class, and then we went in. Uh, it was 12-hour days. Uh, it was about two weeks. I got back uh, last Friday, and um, it was just a really exciting, wonderful time. It was a busy time, uh, but it was wonderful. And I thank you for um, allowing me to go, sort of sending me off. And um, I come back uh, just bearing an excitement for our denomination. Um, the United Church of Christ, which we are affiliated with, is united in Christ. And I think it's obvious in the phrasing, but think about what that means. That we're not necessarily united in all of our theology or all of our church practice, but that we're united in Christ. And there was something really kind of beautiful about that, I thought. Uh, we had some really amazing speakers. Um, on Friday night, the first night of one of the main worship sessions, we had Otis Moss III. Does anyone know who that is? He has taken over for Reverend Wright uh, at the largest, one of the largest UCCs in Chicago, uh, Trinity UCC. Regardless of what we think of Reverend Wright, I can tell you Otis Moss III brought it. It was good. <laughs> He was awesome. Uh, we had Eugene Robinson, who was an MSNBC correspondent, speak about race relations and the sacredness of race and how our dialogue should be uh, focused on Jesus as we talk about race and issues that we, we think of as going forward. Uh, and I also um, got to hear um, a many good speakers, but one that I really, really resonated with was a woman named Barbara Brown Taylor. Has anyone ever heard of her? She, uh, if you go to seminary, Maybe you won't. If you know someone who does, uh, she is renowned for her preaching. She re recently wrote a book, which I recommend, called An Altar in the World, sort of how the sacred meets the everyday. And um, she had some wonderful things to say. Her talk was entitled, and I'm going to look down to get it right, uh, The Fate of Narrative in the Time of Twitter. And I thought that was very clever. Um, she's world-renowned for her preaching. There's books of her sermons. She's a wordsmith in the most wonderful way that that phrase means. Um, and she has just great things to say, I think, to my generation and to her generation, uh, which is, um, and so it was, it was wonderful. And so a lot of what she talked about, I'm gonna use a bit today as in my challenge going forth, that we are tattoos for, um, as living words. Um, and I know the first question you have is, do I have a tattoo? And I wanted to dispel the rumor, I don't have a tattoo. There's two reasons I don't have a tattoo. One, I've never, ever enjoyed needles, voluntarily, in any form, pain in any form, voluntarily. And secondly, I've never found anything clever enough that I wanted on my body for the rest of my life. 
Sorry. I'm somewhat clever, but maybe not that clever. Um, and so I've never, ever understood getting tattoos. I know people get them. Um, I'm not an advocate of them, but I also understand for some it's an art form. I don't think many of our kids have them, but I know that it's a culture out there. Has anyone heard of L.A. Inc., the show L.A. Inc.? I-N-K, right? So there's whole shows on this, this culture of tattoos. And while the Old Testament has some harsh words to say about tattoos, I think that it's not the subversive spiritual thing the Old Testament was talking about. It's a bit of an art form these days. And so um, I look at it as um, it can be beautiful and wonderful. Um, and I look at it as something that you need to be thoughtful about. But there's also bad tattoos still in this culture. Uh, when I was at, um, I was on jury duty two years ago, and I was on a case for murder on the jury. And part of the reason they convicted him, uh, the man that was on trial for murder, was because he had tattoos of a gang on his body. Um, and that was proof they used to say what his affiliation was. So while I think sometimes tattoos can be art, I think we need to be careful. I'm certainly not advocating them. They need to be in a place where it's not very obvious. But we need to be careful about what we affiliate ourselves with. Because sometimes tattoos represent that affiliation, don't you think? And we need to be careful. Um, and it was, it was fascinating for me to think that he was convicted more harshly because they could prove he was in a gang because of a tattoo on his back. Because that t tattoo told a story, didn't it? It told a story of who he associated with, of some of the things he did, and whether or not he did what uh, that gang had done. Now, whatever he had done or not done as associated with that gang, he was still seen as having done those things. Money laundering, uh, possession uh, of a deadly weapon, and murder. So you need to be careful about what you affiliate yourself with. And be careful of the words that you choose to put on yourself, whether figuratively or literally. Um, Twitter. Who knows about Twitter? Raise your hand if you're... I'm not actually on Twitter, but I'm on Facebook. Is anyone on Facebook? Okay. Um, Twitter and Facebook are just means we have of communicating with one another. Um, they're means we have of sharing our lives with each other. You write on Facebook... Um, you know, everyone, know, everyone who's on Facebook with me knows my bunny went to the vet yesterday. Maybe you're not, you don't care, but um, people who do care looked and now they know. They can ask me about it. I, and now all the rage is when you get, have a baby, it's like announced on Facebook, right? And pictures are put up. It's amazing. But I think one of the detriments, and I think Barbara Brown Taylor's comment on you know, rescuing narrative in the time of Twitter is that we need to be careful about um, something that often is very much in association with making ourselves the center of the universe. My thoughts, my views. What did Aaron do today? Let me think about that and share it with the world. The world wants to know. Um, so I think in the age of Twitter, that it's rather difficult to muddle through all of the information we get and to make a choice about what will influence us. Our default narrative is, as I said, jokingly, but it's not so funny, I am the center of the universe. And what's interesting is that the Christian narrative is something a little bit different than that. It is God is the center of the universe, Others should be the center of our care, and ourselves are last. And not in a way that's detrimental to ourselves. We should love ourselves, love our neighbor as ourselves. But that God will take care of us in that sacred narrative where we are not the center of the universe. God still cares about each one of us in the midst of that. And so I wanted to make a case today for why... I think this sacred narrative, the Bible, should be one of the narratives that influences us. It's why in general when I get up to preach, I'm going to preach from this book. Because I think, as Barbara Brown Taylor did, 
that it influences us in powerful ways, and that we gather together in this place called church, ecclesia, the ones that are called out, to center around, as the United Church of Christ says, Christ, but is presented in this narrative. And one of the things that Barb Brown Taylor said, which I thought was fascinating, is learning how to think in this age means exercising some control over what will influence you. And I'm going to make a case for the influence that we have here collectively together. Jesus said in Mark, love God with all your heart, souls, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That confronts our default narrative that I'm the center of the universe. So we choose what will influence us. And I hope we choose the gospel, the good news. Gospel literally means good news. That's all it means. Are we good news? And so there are three criteria that I want to commend to you, to challenge you today, as to what will influence you in every area of your life, but in particular when we meet together as a church. How I will choose what will influence me is any narrative that I will let influence me must encourage me to honor and defend those not like me. Any narrative that I will take in must defend and honor those not like me. If God, if Jesus looks just like me, aren't I sort of worshiping myself in a sense? And God does look like me, but he looks like you, and he looks like you. He looks like everyone gathered here. He looks like churches that are gathered as I speak all over the world who call on the name of Jesus. Jesus constantly, and those who are in my Mark study on Wednesday nights, Jesus constantly confounded those expectations that people put on him and chose to reach out to the leper, to the bleeding woman, to the child who wasn't seen as equal in the eyes of God, to the woman, he touched a woman in that time. He, he constantly encouraged his disciples, and by default us, to reach out to those who are not like us. Secondly, any narrative that I will take into me must allow me to argue with it. I don't mean that we read this book without thought or that we check our brain at the door. There are four gospel stories, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You ever thought about that? That God can live in that tension, and he can withhold and withstand those questions. You know who don't let you question them are dictators. Cults don't let you question anything. We are a place that can question this book. We can ask it tough questions. We can go to it for support, but also bring our brains along with us as we engage in it. And third, any narrative that I will take into me must be honest about the cost of love. Let me say that again. Any narrative I will take within me to influence me must be honest about the cost of love. How much love costs. It costs our pride often. It costs our time. It costs our talents. Anyone here who's a parent knows very well the cost of love. The joy of love, sure. The wonderment of love, the spiritual significance of love, but the cost of love. Jesus not only gave us an example of the cost of love that we celebrate on Easter, and the UCC calls it an extravagant welcome, the cost of being extravagantly loving in a culture or a world that tells us we are the center of the universe is high. And so together in this place, I hope in the coming years, as I'm with you, uh, we will wrestle together with what it means to be the ecclesia, the called out ones, the church of Jesus. That we will see that extravagant love lived out. We will see that questioning tension lived out. 
that we will see that, that understanding of people not like us lived out. And so we come together in this place on Sunday morning to immerse ourselves in that sacred narrative which challenges our default narrative. The Gospel of John talks about Jesus in this way. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Word, logos, creative spirit. At the time of Jesus and the time when John was writing, the Jewish people had a similar theology about word theology. If you read Genesis, God created. What did, how did God create? He spoke. There's something about that creation, that speaking, that word, as we focused on words today. What does it mean for us to be like Jesus, that living word? Um, one of the stories that Barbara Ann Taylor told, she's a college professor. So I think as a college professor in this day and age, you have some interesting students, I would think you'd say. She had a girl that had lots of tattoos all over her body. And she always thought that was fascinating. She didn't understand why. And one day, the girl came into her class, and she had a tattoo on her shoulder that said, and. A-N-D. And. In, like, really big typeface letters. And she looked at Rose, this girl, and said, is there another word I'm missing that we can't see? Is there a sentence? Is there? And Rose began to tell the story of a book that's being pu that was published at that time. But it wasn't published on paper, but it was being published through volunteers that had agreed to have their words of the book tattooed on them. Now, I'm not advocating this, and it's over, so kids don't go looking for it. But she wanted to have the words of the novel living, tattooed, not written on paper. And this was the explanation she gave, and I thought it was fascinating. She says, from this time on, if you choose a letter, a word, and, the participants will be known as the word that's chosen for them. They are not understood as carriers or agents of the text they bear, but its embodiment. As a result, injuries to the printed text, such as dermabrasion, laser surgery, tattoo cover work art, or the loss of body parts, will not be considered to alter the work in any way. You have become that word. So her novel is sitting, part of her novel, is sitting in a class with Barbara Brown Taylor. And part of her novel is at a coffee shop drinking coffee. And part of her novel is cleaning the house. And part of her novel is driving in a car. And part of her novel is walking down the street. See where I'm going? They embodied the word. And I would contend, maybe in a strange way, that that is our commission as the church, as the Christian church. That in a sense, not unlike Jesus, we are that enfleshed word. That there's something about the gospel narrative that is not flat, but it is living with each one of us as we come together to remind ourselves of that story and as we're sent out into the world during the week. That we live out the gospel. That the gospel isn't just a story we read or a set of rules, but it's this amazing transformation that happens. So when someone looks at this girl and says, sees and, there's a story that she can tell about this amazing story. And I would say that we have a story to tell as well, a sacred story of hope and redemption and love and truth. We have a story written on us as well. We have a story that is written on us as well, that the world wants to hear, that we need to be reminded of. So I would ask you, in a certain esoteric sense, or what is your word? What is your word? When you live out your life and day to day, what is it that excites you about living as a church community in this world, 
in this specific community in Manhattan Beach, or in Redondo, or in El Segundo, or in Hermosa, as we gather together, you're sent out to be a part of that living word heritage. The living theological heritage of the UCC. I wanted to prove to you that I actually did work when I was gone. The UCC has a statement, and it describes church in this way. God calls us into the church to accept the cost and joy of discipleship, to be servants in the service of the whole human family, to proclaim the gospel to all the world, get it, proclaim, get that word, get that talk, and resist the powers of evil, to share in Christ's baptism and eat at the table, to join him in his passion and his victory. And I would encourage us, as we wrestle together as a community of faith, on a journey of hope, that we have a redemptive story that our lives should be telling outside of this building. Inside of this building, certainly, but also outside of this building. That we, in a sense, bring something unique to this community. And as I've been here since February, I can say this is a wonderful community, a unique community. And we have a story that we share and a story to tell of Christ. So I would challenge you to think and pray about your word, your word in this world, your good word, your gospel word, your redemptive word, your hopeful word, your truthful word, your good word. Amen. We are pleased that you have joined us for the Sunday morning service from the Manhattan Beach Community Church, an interfaith and interdenominational congregation. We hope that the music and the spoken word have lifted your spirits and have offered guidance and a sense of direction for your life. Have a wonderful week.